Hi, my name is Peter Fatty. I'm a professor at Southern Illinois University and chief science officer of Game Sense Sports. And I want to thank Dan and Chuck for inviting me to talk at Sabre Seminar 2016 on testing and training pitch recognition for player selection, player development, and opponent preparation. Let me first clarify exactly what I'm talking about by pitch recognition. We've uh, all seen these breakdowns, for instance, this very nice breakdown by Robert Adair of the 400 milliseconds uh, a, a batter has to react and what needs to be involved in that reaction in order to hit a 90 mile per hour pitch. What we're really interested in is the first third, that is the pitcher's wind up, release, and first 10 to maybe 20 feet of ball flight. So that's what I've been researching for over 15 years, close to 20 years now, is that couple of seconds of wind-up, release, and immediate ball flight, and what batters can glean from that information that can help them with swing decisions or swing adjustments. So here's how it works. This is the video occlusion method. That is, the pitch is cut off. You're supposed to guess the pitch type or the location. That kind of popped up. We'll say it was a curveball ball. Okay, there's a fastball strike inside corner. They're cut off at different points. You guess the type, you guess the, the location. This is the occlusion method. Now, that's at moment of release. I'm going to say that was fastball. I don't know anything about ball or strike. Okay, I'm saying uh, curveball, maybe strike on that one. Here we go, number five. Five pitch sample test. And here's the results from that. Um, you saw curveball, fastball, fastball. And actually, the first curveball and the last curveball you saw were the same pitch in different occlusion conditions. And that's what we do with the full pitch. It's a 48-pitch matrix. Two pitches, 48 pitch pitches each from two pitchers, 96, darn near 100 pitches seen, two very different types of pitchers, a power lefty, a finesse righty, to try and get at this skill in, in one test. It's a thorough test. Guys just take it on paper, indicating, you know, ball or strike, fastball. We've done that. Here you see in the locker room of a minor league team in, a, uh, in an organization where you've got a, a you know, a, a theater to go in. And then uh, in the, the dark one here, the, the dungeon um, cellar at Orleans in the Cape Cod League where hitting coach Benny Craig takes his guys down, chases out the rats, and has himself a pretty good little meeting room. So we've done this test, this one particular test, to the point where it is a valid and normed test using the 140 minor leaguers as the central point and everything else moves from there. It's kind of a, a 20 to 80 scale. In this case, 50 points is average and um, anything over 55 would be top 25%. Anything below 45 would be bottom 25%. So th those are kind of the cuts that we are we're interested in. And while it's interesting to look at team results, we do see Cape Cod players, for instance, a little higher than minor league, which we would expect. What's more interesting is when you start being able to look at individual players. So here are some of the players from the full season A uh, team where we tested. Um, Robert uh, was a good leadoff hitter. He was promoted. He continued to have a good eye. He struggled a bit with with um, batting average, which you would expect from those results. Thomas, now remember, as I said, 55 and above is top 25%, so he's close to that in type, and his 61 on pitch location would represent about 95th percentile on this, on this um, test. So you look and you say, wow, great hitter. No, Thomas actually was at that point struggling mightily um, at Class A. And the coaches were working with retooling his string, his swing. He needed to produce more power to be a, a corner infielder and have some value to them. Line drive hitter in, in college. But the coach was able to take him these results and say, hey, look, you have, you still show the attribute that the organization drafted you for. We just need to get your, your swing mechanics together. Lorenzo, on the other hand, um, distinctly low scores, and yet this was a successful player. This is a leadoff hitter. Um, and uh, you say, well, could that then be a bad test? Well, Lorenzo retested. I tested in mid-May, and then with player turnover again in July, Lorenzo was one of three guys who retested, got the same scores again. What does that mean? Does that mean bad player? Well, no. It means you, you've got a guy with a flat swing, you cover a, a strike zone the size of a car door, uh, put a lot of balls in play, and a good, smart, disciplined um, hitter, and he could succeed. 
uh, without having a lot of this uh, tool. On the other hand, Jorge was a guy uh, who, who probably is missing this tool. He's a, he's, he's a toolsy outfielder, um, ready uh, with, the, with the organization's eye on him, who has this particular problem. First half all-star, second half uh, collapse as pitchers started to work him a little bit. And there's some decisions to be made then in the organization about uh, a guy like that. So these are some of the uses of pitch recognition testing to a college or a professional baseball organization. You can triangulate these results with analytics, not just the performance analytics, but also the, uh, the swing um, uh, attributes such as bat speed and, and exit velo. And so you could, you could have a guy where you've just got an exit velo and you've got this test and without a lot of observation, you'd have a pretty good idea of their upside hitting ability. So that's that talent identification part. As uh, Dr. Mueller and myself continue to do our research, we are finding some correlations with key batting statistics, perhaps not surprising ones. It's something that can be used to help diagnose player weaknesses. Let's not go messing with a guy's swing mechanics if his problem is that, it, as players tend to say, I'm not seeing the ball, coach. And advancement decisions. And so this is the time of year when a lot of prospects are getting called up. And here's one uh, the the came up last night, you know, before the uh, Sabre Seminar presentation here. Teoscar Hernandez, drafted international uh, free agent, $20,000 signing bonus uh, several years ago. And so, you know, does the organization have a lot in him? Well, he's that toolsy outfielder. You know, if he can fix this problem, and he had the, 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 the pitch recognition problem or the over-aggressive swinging problem in spades, uh, knowing the organization a little bit, they had their rover uh, go out and work with the guy in the California League, concentrated, got him to boost that up. He goes to double A and he kind of reverts back to hit your way off the island. Uh, they've got to work on him there for a, almost two full seasons. He finally gets to triple A. Uh, good coaching there. And so now comes his, uh, his call-up time, last night, in fact. And in his first uh, major league at-bat, Tay Oscar draws a walk. I, mean, I can see the, the hitting crews uh, across the organization standing and cheering. And then in the sixth inning, the real payoff that you get from controlling your at-bat, where he works the count to 3-2 and then hits a home run, uh, leading his team to an important win. You know, so, you know, let's hope that he's able to maintain that. And let's think about how having a measure of this can work with uh, decision, an organization's decisions. Now, let's not give him too much credit. He was not protected in the, in the last Rule 5 draft, and nobody else picked him up either. But if they had that measure on him, that's the kind of thing that can give you that confidence uh, sticking with the guy. We also want to consider test retest method uh, mentioned in Driveline's presentation. And that's something really lacking in baseball. I mean, yeah, we can measure their performance over a certain amount of time with enough at-bats. How many? Is it 100? Is it 200 uh, for, for some of the dimensions? So to have a test retest method. See if there's something happened with a guy. See if your training intervention, whether it's neuroscouting or VR or, or uh, right eye or whatever you might be bringing in there, hopefully game sense, you know, what is the test retest? What changes can we see in a guy's capability to produce as opposed to the actual production and the difference that that makes in, in your decision making? This is what it all works around. This is this simple video occlusion method that's been used in research labs since the early 1980s. That is, the pitch from a batter's point of view, it's cut off in time. This is the most difficult level out of hand. All right, now you can really see it happening with this pitcher, or with this player. He, he, he gets his first split. He's literally leaning in, locking in, and within a few pitches, he's, uh, he's got it again. So that's your moment of, of pitch recognition happening. And yeah. the same method is working as a research method, which that's gives it a lot of validity, a testing method where we now have norm scores, and then also a training method, not just with the technology, but especially as it then works into um, drills and the such. Now here's what it looks like when we reduce it in the modern way to a nice little CAI. Here the guy guesses fastball strike. The system tells him no change up ball. He says, well, I better see a replay. Now he sees a little fuller sort of thing, gets the action of it. Oh yeah, nice action on that. And, you know, time after time after time, hundreds and hundreds of reps with immediate feedback. And then the player and the coach can see what they've worked on, how they've done. And the players available over on the side here, 
These are, in, in our system, uh, minor league players, pitchers, but in the major league level, these could be Sonny Gray or uh, you know, anybody who you might be facing on the next round, the guy who's going to face this, this, next, um, this next series while traveling across the, uh, across the country. Um, going back to that, um, that first study that I showed you, that was back to 2002, and we had a controlled um, control group matched treatment and control groups and showed statistically significant differences in, in performance. It's quite unheard of, a little bit difficult to, uh, to get past the peer review, very high mark. It took about four years to get that in, in print. Now we've got the other type of research, peer-reviewed academic research, that, that supports this approach, and that is what is now turned into a three-year case study with Southeast Missouri State. And this has gotten a lot of press recently because um, CMO's coach was hired to be head coach of Mizzou, and they don't hand out SEC head coaching gigs. And uh, so the, the pitch recognition program has come up really regularly in that, along with the assistant coach Dylan Lawson, who went from CMO to Astros and now back to, to Mizzou. And the, the, the statistics available to that really show what was going on. So we have the initial season, the baseline season before training, where you can see that SEMO was a bit below conference, below the um, Ohio Valley Conference averages on pretty much all those dimensions. Then the first treatment season where they took uh, really, uh, you could only call spectacular leaps in all of those. And that was returning pretty much the entire starting lineup. So they had, a, they had a year of maturity, but they didn't have new players brought in from JUCO or something. The same guys had that kind of leap. And, and we can see there's a lot of consistency in the conference statistics, so we can be confident that that's, that's, a, real, that's a real leap in that. 2015, even with what would seem to be a ceiling effect on, on improvement, the team improved again with the, uh, with the uh, runs per game scoring now going up to about third in the country. And in fact, over those two treatment years, 14 and 15, the number one scoring team in D1. Now, we want to be a little circumspect in looking at these improvements because we see that the 2015 conference statistics are also higher. Conference from 14 to 13 is almost equivalent, very consistent. And then uh, in 2015, the conference jumps up. And of course, that was the introduction of the, of the flat seam ball. Still, we look at the differences between the target team and the conference averages and see some, uh, some, still some substantial improvement getting up to where you've got you know, a 300, 400, 500 slash line as a team. An interesting thing to note is the strikeouts being up in 2015, even back to where they were uh, pre-training and up over the league average, but the walks are also up, so the walk-to-strikeout ratio is maintained, and I think what you see here is the selective-aggressive approach in the first year favoring selective and in the second year favoring aggressive. So, this is what we're looking at with video occlusion testing and training of pitch recognition. A very simple approach, 40 years of use in research laboratories, um, easily adaptable to talent identification, to player development within a system, and at the very highest levels of uh, actual opponent preparation. So I want to, uh, to, to point to these references. They're all available on my website. Um, the, the work with uh, Sean Mueller, which has uh, just got another acceptance, a new, another article that will be coming out in Journal of Sports Sciences. And you can check all of those materials on my academic website, peterfatty.com. And, of course, I also invite you to check Game Sense Sports and, uh, and see how this is all now being, uh, being wrapped out into an uh, approach, a technology and training approach for teams. So thanks again to Dan and Chuck for uh, letting me speak at Sabre Seminar. And um, we'll see you next year.